Now uh, I will invite uh, another eminent speaker, uh, Professor Eve Ville, is a professor of obstetrics and gynecology at the Paris University. Uh, he's chairing the maternity and fetal medicine department um, in the Malice Hospital. Is the one of the largest in the France. Uh, he uh, did his fellowship uh, at the Research Center King's uh, College in London. He worked as a senior lecturer at St. George uh, Medical School in London. He became a professor and chair of, in Paris University in 1998. He's also a member of French Academy of Medicine and the International Academy of Perinatal Medicine. He's the incoming president of the International Society of Ultrasound in Obstetrics and Gynecology. Professor Yves uh, Wille will be uh, going to uh, talk about the fetal therapy and this current status. I welcome Professor. Thank you for this uh, kind introduction. So the, uh, the topic of today is uh, fetal therapy, and we will mean with that fetal direct intervention. And fetal surgery is at large designating any direct fetal intervention, mainly invasive. And although the, the technical challenges have been addressed recently by developing minimally, so-called minimally invasive surgery through endoscopy and micro-instruments, also uh, often designated as a keyhole surgery, the ethical uh, challenges remain um, irrespective of the uh, degree of invasiveness. Now, um, the situations in which fetal surgery uh, should be offered or could be offered have been arbitrarily defined 26 years ago by a group of physicians particularly involved in fetal care that would be some obstetricians and many, mainly uh, pediatric surgeons within a group called the International Fetal Medicine Surgery Society and that was designed in uh, 1981. And the uh, prerequisites for thinking of fetal therapy were known at natural history of the disease that the disease or the malformation should be either lethal if left untreated in utero uh, or only uh, uh, treated even in the best uh, circumstances after birth and that the untreated cases, if they were not lethal, should uh, lead to severe morbidity even following the best postnatal treatment that the intervention planned in neutral should at least partially correct the uh, problem. And then, and that's probably the most difficult part, that the, uh, once a therapy has been applied in neutral, it should be compared with the best available postnatal treatment. Now there's a variety of conditions that could be or are already subjected to fetal therapy. And there are two uh, main directions here. One is the complete cure of the problem in utero, and these are mainly functional problems such as problems arising between two monochionic twins or with a placental vascular tumor, whereby you just devascularize the placenta or the chorioangioma using, using a, a laser technique, and I'll come back to this one. Um, but most uh, therapies offered in utero aim at stopping the progress of the disease and the irreversible damage that could be uh, progressing in utero, waiting for the complete uh, treatment uh, after birth. And that is the case for most compressive lesions, whether these are effusions, for example, in the lungs or in the bladder, uh, and, and struggling against these consequences, mainly pulmonary hypoplasia or renal insufficiency for bladder obstruction.
Now, the uh, main progress that has been made since, since 1981 is to recognize the very early awareness for pain uh, felt by fetuses, and this was based on early uh, dosage of uh, various uh, chemicals in fetal blood while doing uh, intravascular uh, transfusion in anemic fetuses, comparing funicular injection and intrahepatic vein transfusion that showed that the stress uh, shown by fetuses directly uh, uh, traversed by a needle uh, was much higher. And therefore, fetal anesthesia is mandatory and should be applied prior to any in directly invasive procedure. And anesthesia is not synonymous of paralysis and the use of pancuronium does not relieve stress or pain, so that should be preceded by the use of a proper anesthetic, mainly sufentanil, at doses that are compatible with general anesthesia in the neonate. This anesthesia can be given uh, mainly intravenously, or uh, if, if uh, technically uh, challenging, this anesthesia can still be given now intramuscular at the same doses and does relieve the stress and or the pain of the fetus depending on its gestational age and should be applied to all fetuses by 20 weeks and onwards. Now, the uh, development of fetal surgery following natural history of the disease usually comes from one or a few case reports and small case control studies. Then comes the idea and some enthusiastic researcher will apply a treatment to a very unusual situation. And it raises discussions among specialists, and when nearly as many specialists believe that the intervention is justified, then with an equal number or, or, or just above the number of specialists who still believe that this is unnecessary, you reach the stage of equipoise or the principle of equivalence. And this is at this moment that a randomized control study should be uh, undertaken in order to establish once and for all or uh, at least a, a major step forward to establish the uh, efficacy of this treatment. This has rarely been done in uh, fetal medicine and usually uh, because of the rarity of the uh, problem and the uh, insufficient diffusion of competence and difficult techniques, this usually carries as a very either experimental or on a small scale uh, in, a few, in a few centers. Uh, this was true historically from fetal anemia, and Lily in New Zealand never uh, did a randomized study to prove that a dying fetus from anemia with high drops would benefit from intrauterine transfusion, but some could argue that there was never a randomized study to prove that jumping off a plane with a parachute was particularly useful. So some situations do not need randomized studies. At the other end of the spectrum, we uh, conducted a randomized study establishing that the best treatment for twin-to-twin -twin transfusion syndrome was fetal surgery and placental surgery, and I'll come back to that. And most conditions are still in between with either stagnant or accumulating evidence for either their utility or uh, uh, otherwise. And this is the case for one of the uh, most commonly practiced fetal surgical intervention, which is the shunting of a compressive effusion from the fetus to the amniotic fluid through a plastic catheter. And when this first cumulative report reported the cumulative experience of the IFMSS uh, specialist shunting all sorts of effusions enthusiastically since 1981, it ended up in a dead end saying that there was no evidence that shunting both hydronephrosis and hydrocephalus would help the fetus in any way, and that's not surprising uh, 26 years down the road. Now, shunting pleural effusion has never been subjected to a randomized control study, 
And, and therefore, it is still questionable if that helps at all a fetus that would not be hydropic, because apart from preventing death from cardiac tamponade from a bilateral pleural effusion with high drops uh, in the fetus, the evidence for that to prevent the development of pulmonary hypoplasia has never been shown. And altogether, you can expect a 60% survival rate following shunting, including series with a large proportion of hydropic fetuses. So there is a kind of a soft consensus to, uh, to think and, and pretend that shunting is definitely the way uh, to, do, to, to go when there is high drops, uh, but it is still in the air as to whether we should shunt any uh, effusion without signs of uh, fetal distress of cardiac insufficiency. And the same applies to uh, macrocystic, congenital cystic adenomatoid malformation, where those hydropic cases do apparently benefit from shunting by reducing the size of the tumor on average of 60% and allow uh, high drops to resolve before birth. But we don't know what to do with microcystic CCAM and the handful of cases that are being operated uh, in utero with a laparotomy and a hysterotomy in the States seems to bring good results back, but the largest series, if I'm not mistaken, is of less than 20 cases ever published. Um, but we'll come back to the issue with open surgery. Another long-standing uh, question mark is that of uh, the low urinary tract obstruction, the LUTO. And these, first of all, uh, are always uh, difficult to diagnose because all LUTOs are not posterior urethral valves. Actually, even experts get it wrong uh, in 50% of the cases both ways, although the only condition that would really benefit from shunting is actually posterior urethral valves because the other anomalies attached to LUTO are primary uh, uh, developmental abnormalities starting probably with severe renal alterations from the embryonic stage and therefore are not probably amenable to any curative form of treatment. Now, what the shunting aims at in LUTO is to avoid the development of hanidramnios and therefore avoiding the development of pulmonary hypoplasia and then it aims at relieving the pressure of the, on the kidneys and therefore preventing renal insufficiency from, from renal dysplasia. And uh, also, uh, to a minor in extent, because the shunting could actually cause by itself urodynamic abnormalities to help functional urination in these fetuses. Now, uh, what happens uh, with uh, severe forms of LUTO is that the low obstruction creates muscular development of the bladder, and in itself, this will cause higher up obstruction of the ureter into the bladder that will not be relieved by shunting. So that is the major uh, pitfall of using a shunt in low urinary tract obstruction. You actually don't relieve the pressure of the kidneys in the severe forms that are uh, subjected to treatment, and therefore you may not prevent a large, to a large extent the development of uh, renal dysplasia and renal insufficiency. And if one looks at the mixed bag of what LUTO is, in about half of the cases you get multiple malformations or chromosomal abnormalities or genetic disease that will not make the results of fetal therapy very good. In a fourth to a to half of the cases, there will be associated pulmonary hypoplasia from the time of diagnosis in the second trimester. And about a third or a fourth of those who survive, survive with uh, renal dysplasia and renal insufficiency, which leads altogether to 30 to 70 percent perinatal death, all causes together. We are not very good in assessing the renal function in utero and especially the prediction of the postnatal uh, function. The sensitivity and specificity of the tools we've got using biochemistry and imaging is about 80%. So there's a 
uncertainty at least, and uncertainty prenatally often leads to uh, termination of pregnancy. There was a systematic review of series dealing with uh, intrauterine bladder uh, shunting in LUTO. And it showed, or it suggested rather, that it would increase survival of the worst cases, especially those with anhydramnios, probably by preventing pulmonary apoplasia, but no evidence that renal function could be improved by shunting. So there was a big uh, a multicentric study worldwide, so uh, much so that it was, it was so difficult to recruit cases for it, called the Pluto study. And although it's not been published yet, to my knowledge, but has been presented in several uh, meetings, the results of the Pluto are exactly the same as that of the systematic review of the literature. So we're back to scratch. We don't know what to do with that. And therefore, experimental surgery uh, uh, takes over, and this experimental surgery is to try and do a fetal cystoscopy uh, transabdominally, and through which, first of all, the diagnosis of posterior urethral valve could be confirmed, as in a pediatric uh, setting, and avoiding the 50% error in diagnosing posterior urethral valve. And once you've diagnosed posterior urethral valve such on these uh, fetoscopic uh, images, you may use a laser fiber and just burn the valve at least partly from above so that urination could start again in utero and the pressure could be relieved through the natural pathway, therefore potentially preserving the uh, urodynamic function in the neonates uh, after that. That might be true. The results so far are very inconvincing because we are still at the experimental phase, but very soon, hopefully, uh, once the uh, criteria for intervention are a bit more uh, uh, standardized, a randomized study might uh, uh, be useful and on its way. I told you that at least one condition was subjected to randomized control study and successfully so, and this is the treatment of twin-to-twin -twin transfusion syndrome. This syndrome is a dysfunction between two monochronic twins when roughly one is getting too much and the other one too little, and this uh, triggers hemodynamic insufficiency in both twins, but mainly in the so-called recipient uh, that can get into uh, heart failure, whereas the other one uh, goes into oligohydramnios and renal insufficiency. And we uh, developed a technique uh, minimally invasive through a two millimeter scope transabdominally under local anesthesia for the mother, uh, aiming at separating the two placental circulation of these twins, transforming them into functionally at least dichorionic twins. And with this, compared to the traditional way before the late 1990s that was to drain out the excessive amount of fluid produced by the recipient twin, proved that survival was uh, higher after placental surgery, that morbidity was much lower, uh, both through uh, the surgery itself and by preventing most of the very preterm birth related to twin-to-twin -twin transfusion syndrome. This has not completely uh, solved the issue, and there is another randomized trial on its way for early stages of TTTS to, to see if it is justified to intervene early or if we should wait. We've also uh, uh, compiled the literature that shows that similarly to uh, our results, the risk of uh, neurological impairment uh, in the survivors is roughly less than 10% and mainly related to prematurity rather than the syndrome itself. We also followed our cohort of survivors up to the age of six years with neurological and developmental tests and showed that the benefit from intrauterine surgery was maintained six years down the road with a, uh, a better uh, function and less impairment in and a normal uh, development basically in survivors once they've catched up the, with the, uh, the effects of prematurity. Now, where are we now in, in some other studies? 
Ideally, uh, once the natural history of the disease is known, you should go for an animal model mimicking the problem that you've diagnosed in humans. Well, for twins, it was impossible because the only animal model having monochorionic twins on a regular basis is, the, uh, is some armadillo in the Andes. And because of the uh, armor that this animal is naturally wearing, phytoscopy is not an easy task. So we gave up with the animal model. But for most other conditions, you can find animal models. And once you've tested this on animal models, you have at some point to uh, get to the uh, human. And then, at least in the conditions we're going to mention, because they are otherwise lethal, the risk is to change the uh, outcome, predicted outcomes of death into that of a severe handicap. And once this is explained in utero, in, in the pregnancy, this puts the alternative of termination of pregnancy as an alternative actually to fetal therapy. This is true of congenital diaphragmatic hernia. And the approach was done in the right way. The uh, pregnant U is a perfect model uh, to study the development of CDH and its treatment. Open surgery was performed for nearly 20 years before uh, Michael Harrison coming on stage and saying that he went the wrong direction and recognizing that 20 years of effort were contributive to the natural history but not to the treatment. And when we initiated this revival of fetoscopy for twin-twin transfusion designing uh, microendoscopes, this was taken back to the lab in the pregnant hue developing another technique to address the issue of diaphragmatic hernia, not aiming at a complete cure in utero, but at preventing the development of pulmonary hypoplasia, leaving the surgery for after birth. Pulmonary hypoplasia, due to the compression of the uh, thoracic uh, contents by the uh, content of the hernia from the abdomen, is the main contributor to fetal death or, or, or fetal, uh, or, or sorry, neonatal death or neonatal uh, uh, respiratory problems uh, by inducing also hypertensive uh, pulmonary circulation. And it is possible to roughly estimate the development of the contralateral lung with a very simple ultrasound measurement uh, described over 20, 20 years ago the lung-to-head ratio. And by putting together the value of the uh, observed of our expected lung-to-head ratio at a given gestation and the position of the liver either down in the abdomen or up in the hernia, you can actually draw a, a different prognostic of, of survival, percentage of survivals, uh, far before birth and ideally at around 25, 28 weeks. Now, uh, what people have learned from sheep experiment in as much as from laryngeal atresia, a severe malformation in the human, is that obstruction of the trachea would cause a, 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 a hyperpressure on the uh, developing uh, alveoles and, and stimulate, overstimulate and cause overgrowth of the lungs. Now, if you leave them for too long, these huge lungs will be useless functionally, but if you leave them for just about five to six weeks in the human, that may produce bigger lungs and functional lungs. And that's the uh, motto for the new strategy of addressing congenital diaphragmatic hernia in utero. You go in with a microendoscope, you intubate the fetus, you leave a balloon in the trachea, five weeks later you go back and you remove the balloon. That was initiated at the, uh, feet, at the highest birthright in London uh, and in Belgium in Leuven. And this showed on the first 200 cases that in cases where on the left, uh, in the left 
Dan Frank Matikur, yeah, survival was expected to be about 10% because pulmonary hypoplasia was very likely to develop. Survival in this group was about 50%. And in the right-sided diaphragmatic area, which had an even worse prognosis with a constant pressure of the liver, where survival was anecdotal, survival in this group was 35%. And therefore, there was a first randomized study performed in the States by Michael Harrison uh, at, uh, in the University of California. And uh, what he did, they, they used open surgery, a mixture of open surgery and of fetoscopy. They put clips or ligation on the trachea. There was a mixed bag of techniques altogether. And their conclusion was that there was no benefit. But when you analyze the results, the majority of their cases has actually not such a bad prognosis on the uh, lung estimates. And the survival rate of their cases was expected anyway to be around 60% or above. And if you sub-analyze the subgroup of cases where this LHR was really low, they obtained 33% survival, which was a, a, good, a good result. And therefore, this uh, has to lead to a new uh, randomized study currently uh, performed uh, in Europe, whereby all cases are done with fetoscopy, and the most severe cases, we would expect uh, survival as the right endpoint. And in the moderate cases from the start, we would look at bronchopulmonary dysplasia as an endpoint and not surgery. This can be done again under local anesthesia with a scope that is two millimeter in diameter and intubation is done on average in about 15 minutes. Managing uncertainty also applies now to critical aortic stenosis or pulmonary stenosis in order to prevent subsequent hypoplasia of the left or the right heart respectively. Uh, this technically is not that much of a challenge. It can be done again, this time even less invasively, using a 18 gauge needle under uh, ultrasound uh, guidance by entering the uh, left ventricle and pushing a catheter in the uh, stenotic uh, valve, inflating the catheter and stripping the valve off as it would be done at birth in the uh, not that severe cases. Now, it is not a technical challenge, as I said, but the main question remains at this experimental stage as to which cases would benefit from that and in which cases this would be uh, even uh, something iatrogenic to do. And there is no consensus among cardiologists uh, at this stage. Finally, uh, fetal surgery has gone another step, either forward or backward, which is to address non-lethal anomalies that can be cured after birth, such as myelomeningocele, uh, Nick Wald has so eloquently uh, advocated for prevention. Now, um, we know the consequences of this disease and fetal intervention had been advocated to relieve the Arnold Chiari malformation, not expecting any improvement in the motor function. That was the experience of 10 years of open surgery in the United States. They went into a randomized trial known as the MOMS trial, published recently in the New England Journal of Medicine, and to their surprise and the surprise of everyone, there was a moderate improvement in motor function in the cases operated in utero. This went with a significant morbidity in the women and uh, at least dooming them to have cesarean sections even if the pregnancy was uh, miscarrying and certainly for the following pregnancies and potentially with other complications such as placenta accreta. I'll just skip this one for the sake of time. If one now, and it's high time to do that, to look at maternal morbidity of these procedures, we don't really know about the risk of maternal death. Supposedly, it hasn't been reported, and therefore, supposedly, it has not happened. 
This is for open uh, surgery, chorioaminitis, severe hemorrhage, pulmonary edema, blood transfusion, and placental abruption are in significant uh, amount. If you look now at the least invasive, so-called minimally invasive procedures, severe complications still occur in 2% of the cases and probably are underreported, so we should be very careful about that. Moving to ethical issues, this starts with our own Hippocratic oath of maintaining and ensuring our competence. And therefore, when a trendy technique shows up, it's like a flag for an obstetric unit and everything, everybody seems that they are allowed to put their hands on it and play with the toys. But we, in that case, often abuse of statistics that are produced by experimented centers and we should be uh, very careful not to disclose any information or conflict of interest, mainly scientific, of course, to the patients, meaning to the pregnant woman. Um, and remember that in prenatal treatment, the ethics that probably uh, applies, even if it doesn't say its name, is the ethics of utility, whereby women have to work up what is the consequences that they would think are the best and they would like to go for, and revert, conversely, the consequences that they would regard as the worst and want to avoid at all price. And they often go through this making a choice. Now, termination of pregnancy is an alternative in most countries, even if it's topped up by some gest upper gestation above which it cannot be performed. But Remember that, how awful that seems to be to uh, uh, sometimes do a late termination. The prognosis of a fetus cannot, cannot be assessed in those complicated situations before late second or early third trimester. And if you rush for termination in early second trimester, you would actually kill more fetuses than you would save babies. And that's something that has to be remembered and taken into account. It's kind of a quantitative ethics, which doesn't seem to uh, fit very well with the idea of ethics, but it's not worse than topping up the gestation at which a termination can be performed. And to finish with on a happier note, just to pay tribute to those who, 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 who actually, to acknowledge those who pay the heaviest tribute to fetal surgery. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, uh, Professor uh, Wille has to leave early, uh, so uh, we can have a discussion. If you have a question for Professor, uh, you can ask now. Uh, yes, you have a question. Uh, I'm not sure that you hear me or not. Yeah. Fetoscopy is not available. Is early diagnosis of uh, multi twin pregnancy an early intervention with amnio reduction or not? Um, frankly, um, twin twin transfusion is often an emergency. In order to reduce the occurrence of that emergency, monoclonic twins probably should be followed up every two weeks. And therefore, twin twin should be recognized with the early signs, and ideally, this woman should be directed to a unit performing that surgery. Amnio reduction is just an emergency measure to prevent miscarriage. The problem is that once you've done an amnio reduction, surgery is much more difficult to perform, and the, research, the results are worse. So ideally, there should be a regional distribution of centers being able to perform this, People should be properly trained, and we've done this experiment with uh, Chennai, where this doctor came to us for four months, and then he went back to Chennai, and for one year, every single procedure he was doing, we would assist him by video conferencing. So I think there are ways to acquire a proper competence and experience, and I don't think we can hide behind our small finger to say, well, you know, I'd rather do it because there's no one in the area doing it. Do it, do it properly, train for that, and uh, 
There are modern ways of assisting that kind of surgery, which is basically video surgery. You don't have to be in the room for that. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor, for your lecture. And uh, we have a break now, and we will meet uh, 15.45 sharp so we can finish uh, our last session. Thank you very much.